I am the uh, research director for the business for the Center for the Business of Sustainability. Even I have trouble saying that sometimes. Um, and the center itself is new as a university center. So we're officially a center as of 2019. But as Kate noted, we have had initiatives, uh, research, activity in the business school related to sustainability for at least 15 years, um, if not longer, uh, under the initial leadership of Jerry Sussman. Um, so uh, the director of our center is uh, Eric Foley, and I certainly want to acknowledge his amazing work in leading our center and making sure that we have not just maintained um, some activity, but we are expanding, I would say even exploding in our activity. Um, we have had so many new initiatives over the last year. Uh, it's been a real privilege to be associated with the center. Uh, and one of the reasons why I took on the role of research director is we decided we had so much going on, we needed to split up our roles a little bit. So uh, that's been exciting. Um, let me, uh, oops, let me, there we go. Uh, move to a slide here where I can just kind of give some introductions about um, what we are as a center. And let, just to uh, give you some background, what I want to try to do today is I want to say a few words about the center. I want to really talk about um, research more than anything else, because this is something that we don't always get the opportunity uh, to discuss in any detail, uh, certainly outside the college. We do have research seminars, uh, we have grants, we have things like that that go on inside the college, but uh, I think this is a really um, exciting opportunity to tell a broader audience about some of what we do um, as business school research and sustainability, uh, something that doesn't necessarily flow off the tongue, but is incredibly important to us. Um, so um, the, uh, the center, just as a, 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 a general description, uh, is composed of um, faculty and research, students and alumni, companies and membership. So in other words, we kind of you know, look at three different uh, connections to, to outside uh, and inside groups. So we have um, you know, the things that we produce as faculty and research, which I wanna talk about, but we also believe in student engagement and alumni engagement and making sure that the uh, business mission for sustainability is promoted. Um, and also we bring in companies who give us information and take information away from us so that there's that great collaborative relationship. One thing I, I think it's important to emphasize um, about our center is that is the Center for the Business of Sustainability as opposed to the Center for Sustainable Businesses. Uh, and this is something that uh, our research director, research director, our center director, um, Eric Foley, likes to uh, emphasize that this is not just about sustaining businesses, like keeping them going, but this is about creating the business case for sustainability uh, and communicating it uh, to our students, helping companies facilitate it, um, it more strongly um, within uh, their institutions. Um, and also, you know, coming up with, with, with new research ideas, new programs, new, um, new notions about, uh, about how to do that. Um, so uh, we do that. So we have a, obviously a large group of undergraduate students at the Smeal College, and they all get contacted with sustainability in some form. And our um, uh, uh, teaching uh, leader um, uh, is uh, Susie Wright, and uh, she's actually compiling this web page that is going to uh, help students understand where sustainability falls within the curriculum. So that's that's a really important endeavor. Um, is we have at least 30 faculty who've been involved in sustainability in some way or another, and I'm going to get into that a little bit more. Um, we have uh, founding uh, company members, uh, Verizon, Purdue, um, and um, uh, oh, um, and. Uh, um, uh, IBM <laughs> um, and, and many other corporate members as well. Um, and so we do what we do through grant programs, through conferences, um, and um, like I say, helping students understand um, their, uh, what they get out of sustainability. Um, we uh, are looking to continue expanding. Um, and so we are looking to increase our corporate memberships. We're gonna be doing more research projects that we can demonstrate have an impact um, and we want enhanced engagement across the college. And so with that point, I really wanna make it clear that um, the reason I'm here today 
the reason I wanted to be here today, the reason I'm excited about talking to you today is we want to collaborate more with the university, uh, uh, with other, uh, other colleges at the university, with other researchers at the university, with those who work with components of the university that might see some connection to the business school. So one of the things I hope to do is give you some idea of what we can do here at the business school. Um, this is um, uh, our sort of center work plan. This is how we do what we do. Um, and um, you note that uh, we, we look at it in terms of research, educational programs, alumni engagement, industry engagement, and actually social ventures. Um, and so we look to engage the community in a variety of different ways with new business models um, and emphasizing the idea of products, processes, and policies. That's kind of how we think about what it is we want to eventually have an impact on. Um, and my job as research director, um, my honor, I should say, uh, to serve as research director is to help us um, engage in the analysis, um, to support the analysis through administering grant programs to ensure that those who are already engaging in the business research um, have the ability to uh, facilitate the kind of research they want to do, um, and that we can also promote it through communication. Um, and my um, obligation at this point, I think, is to increase our collaboration with other disciplines and institutes, um, and eventually to uh, do more to implement what we do in the business school. So um, this is kind of where I'm looking at analysis, communication, collaboration, and implementation is, is uh, uh, some of the most important things we can do. Um, all right, so that's, that's my overview. Um, but um, let me get into some more specifics about uh, what our research looks like at the business school, um, what our sustainability uh, focus has been in the last year or so. And, and the reason I, I want to talk about some recent things is, is to give you, well, sort of a picture of where we're going to be going in the future. Um, but also, I think there are some lessons for um, centers like ours. And certainly, we have learned a lot of lessons in the last year about how to um, deal with shifting environments, um, certainly with uh, um, some of the emerging crises we've experienced over the last few months. And so this is, um, I, th I think there's some, some useful opportunities for us to reflect back on what we've done um, and to use, for me to use this session as a way to not just communicate what we do, but communicate how we've made some shifts. And so let me start with that. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, I took on the, the role of, or I should say, as Kate introduced, and I reflected, I took on the role as a uh, research director about a year ago, and we had all kinds of great initiatives planned and all kinds of conferences planned, um, some of which happened until the pandemic hit. And we, of course, had to quickly shift online like, uh, uh, like most of us did um, in most respects. Um, and so we had to think about what our role was going to be in this new um, uh, pandemic oriented world where concerns um, about uh, human health uh, you know, obviously take precedence over so many other business concerns and maybe even over sustainability concerns. So, you know, interesting, one of the, the questions we got early on is um, what's the role of sustainability in business? And is there a role in this you know, crisis environment for sustainability in business? Um, in other words, um, is this something that, that should be shifted to the background? Is this something that companies should be expecting to abandon? We wanted to ask actually those questions. And so initially uh, we took on this, what we would call an inside look series uh, of seminars um, of webinars, I should say, uh, where we invited members of the business community to come in and talk about what it is um, they were doing in response to the pandemic, but also how their sustainability programs were uh, surviving, uh, and to give some hope and some guidance uh, to those who um, are, are hoping to keep alive um, sustainability uh, interests. And this is just a little video. I, I'm not going to show very much of this, but you can get an idea from one of our local um, sustainable company leaders, Josh Helke, um, to, uh, who, who leads organic climbing. Let's see if I can get this to work. But essentially the same question that Eric uh, asked to Wayne, uh, which is, uh, can you give us a, a, some update and some background on how your firm has been responding to this crisis? Oh, gladly. Yeah. Um, so we're always set up to 
so as efficiently as possible in our factory because we're marketing the solar zone aspect. Um, so the second that stop work mandate came down and a lot of the CDC guidelines for social distancing, um, we had to shut our operation down for a week. Um, although our phone was ringing off the hook, um, you know, from fellow researchers at Penn State and all over the country looking for emergency um, personal protective gear sewing. Um, and that was just this reminder that we had this set of skills that had basically been dead for years in the United States. Um, so we, we ended up getting a exemption from Governor Wolf to reopen um, to do emergency manufacturing, um, which to do it in a way that we felt comfortable for the safety of our employees, we ended up moving six of our employees into remote um, work operations. I'm, I'm in my garage right now. <laughs> um, and we have a bunch of people sewing at their kitchens or wherever we could move a industrial sewing machine. Um, and then we ended up keeping some more people in the shop, but we took over. We have a retail area that we moved out and put manufacturing um, so we could actually keep people 24 feet apart, which just felt a little bit safer to us than the six feet apart. Um, well, so, essentially the same well, question. Uh, sorry about that. So you can get an idea of the challenges that a company like that faces, and they have a tradition of using sustainably sourced materials um, that they wanted to maintain in this environment while also supporting the uh, um, individuals that uh, they employed uh, um, in, in, in you know, maintaining their, um, their, their relationships with people, you know, part of the triple bottom line, as we like to say. Um, we also had, uh, we conducted a series of these insight lectures with individuals who had different pieces of information to contribute about um, not just the pandemic response, but of course, you know, the, the uh, the emerging uh, or growth, I should say, of interest in um, in social responsibility, in um, in social justice, I should say. Um, and so, uh, um, Lori Francis um, uh, gave a particularly interesting talk about uh, racial health disparities, and this is also available on our website. But just to give you a quick uh, glimpse of this, this is and what the comorbidity is, is just a little bit about that, and particularly what the comorbidities are associated with coronavirus. And kind of, can you help connect the dots on the comorbidities, historic, systemic, you know, racism, um, other things that are causing the disproportionate impact on people of color and low income communities? Yeah, sure. So um, why don't we start with the comorbidity? So a comorbidity um, is some underlying disease or condition that places people at higher risk um, for disease like coronavirus. Um, and what we know is that diseases that suppress your immune system, um, diabetes, um, having cancer, um, having any chronic lower re respiratory diseases like bronchitis or emphysema, certainly asthma, um, tuberculosis, all these things place people at greater risk for complications due to coronavirus. I would not necessarily say that they place people at risk for contracting the virus. However, if you get it, um, huge complications um, and there's a higher risk of mortality or, or death from coronavirus. Um, so all of those diseases that I just listed are all disproportionately higher in black populations compared to other populations. So even compared to other minority um, populations. So. Um, diabetes. Um, the highest prevalence of diabetes is actually in native populations, but the highest mortality rates um, are in black populations. And so, with the, um, the, the reason I, I show you this is this, I think, was an important shift for us to make sure that we maintained um, the sustainability programs that we have, the sustainability, sustainability interests we have um, in view of the changing world environment. So we thought um, it was uh, important to not simply carry on business as usual or sustainable business as usual, but uh, to, to try to respond and show that we were a center that had something to say um, about uh, uh, a world in crisis. And so um, I, I present that because um, it, it's, we, we've had these discussions about um, how we can play a role both in research, but also in communication with students and with you know, our broader stakeholder communities um, to, to make it clear that the business for the center, the center for the business sustainability um, actually can um, not just 
you know, maintain current programs and not just realign when we have conference funding that's uh, that's left around, but we can also say something new and make it an additional contribution. Um, and, and speaking of money that's left around, one of the other things we did is we made sure we recaptured money we didn't spend and we uh, refunded or, or, or pushed it back in, I should say, uh, to our granting program. So um, this year we awarded about three times the amount of grants that we typically would. Uh, for basic research and sustainability. Uh, and these typically go to, uh, to Smeal College individuals, but they, they could be potentially aware, uh, available for collaborations um, with faculty from across the university who work with Smeal College uh, faculty members. Um, and so even though you know, $36,000 isn't a tremendous amount of money, it, it is a major increase for us in what we give for these uh, typically small under $10,000 grants. And we uh, um, actually awarded six proposals this year. So we're happy to not just leave money sitting around in accounts unspent, hoping for the world to open up again and to spend on, on, on more lunch uh, foods and, and, and other kinds of uh, hotel costs and things like that, but to say, let's do something with it now and see if we can actually make a difference. Um, so uh, do, uh, I want to say a, a few words, and I want to give you just some, some insight into a little bit of the research that we have. And I'm going to do a quick survey, um, and I don't have a ton of time to do this, and I'm not going to go into the, um, any level um, that would approach the actual paper delivery. But I want to give you a quick survey of some of the research we do. And I'm hoping that by doing this, I, I give you some incentive to contact me, to contact Eric, um, to contact uh, Megan Nolman, our administrator, in, in uh, start the conversation um, or continue conversations about working with us on sustainability initiatives and sustainability research. So here's some changes that we've made uh, literally in the last year. Um, we have a new affiliates program where instead of just generally saying we have 30 faculty members who are kind of involved in sustainability research or published an article, we have these uh, set affiliates who have committed um, to being part of our sustainability mission. Um, so not all of these affiliates uh, dedicate their full time to sustainability research, but many of them have a large component of their research in sustainability. Moreover, um, we've really worked to identify our research strengths. So there's a lot of different kinds of business research that could be related to sustainability. And we really took a hard look at ourselves to say, where is it that we have uh, a real expertise compared to other schools that were really out in front? And so we came up with these six areas um, or I should say we've identified these six areas, which is uh, sustainable investing in ESG performance, uh, uh, product development and consumer behavior, supply chain, of course, we have one of the most prominent supply chain departments in the entire country, uh, social responsibility and activism, institutional social change, and my uh, expertise, legal incentives and regulatory impacts. And so um, what I wanted to do, um, well, in, in part in saying this, um, I will note that you are welcome, encouraged, um, and we hope you will contact these individuals or contact me and I will put you in touch with these individuals. We are uh, starting today um, a new web page um, or series of web pages on the SMEAL site that will give you this information. So for the first time, you can um, actually see some more detail about this um, research expertise at a level deeper than you can find from our typical directory. So I, I wanted to introduce that, but also um, I thought I'd just do some quick highlights of some of the research in this area. These are um, some recent papers in some cases, some are um, unpublished and still works in process, but like I said, they hopefully will give you some guides into some pinpoints on where I think uh, we have some really uh, unique things to say about this area. Um, and maybe again, they'll give you some um, uh, ideas about how you might collaborate with the business school, or work with us um, and uh, uh, otherwise, you know, engage in our mission. Um, so uh, one area, like I said, is maybe not a surprise for a business school, sustainable investing in, in environmental social governance uh, performance, ESG performance, uh, ESG being sort of the outside view of corporate social responsibility being more the, you know, the internal way that companies look at um, their social responsibility missions. And so, you know, basically what's the impact uh, on uh, investor and stakeholder interest when companies engage in environmental, social and governance? Um, what are the metrics? Um, how fair are the metrics? So we look at the state of sustainable investing, the quality of the reporting, financial risk, 
Um, and so let me give you an example. One particular uh, uh, research project, which I, uh, is pretty interesting. So what Peter uh, Ilyeva and Lucas Roth from University of Alberta did is they looked at whether corporate directors um, drive corporate sustainability. And so there's a, a pretty under, well understood uh, a body of research that, that suggests that, that investors can have an impact, but what about the directors? And so what they did is they conducted a project where they looked at sustainability shocks um, from outside the country um, that had an impact on directors um, who shared responsibility for firms outside the United States and inside the United States, and then compared those um, to uh, firms where they didn't have those same shocks. And they were able to demonstrate that directors actually have, um, in some cases, um, have a discernible impact on whether or not corporations engage um, in uh, sustainability efforts. And they were also able to demonstrate that following those shocks being things like new reporting requirements or new laws, that those directors uh, also uh, can increase productivity. Um, they, they, have a, a, they have the ability to increase productivity in corporations. And so, um, what this does for the first time is kind of demonstrates a new role uh, for a, uh, uh, a, a new corporate leader um, in sustainability and uh, demonstrates some ways that you might impact how corporations view sustainability by thinking about the composition of directors rather than just uh, what kinds of firms investors engage in. Um, so that's maybe, you know, the kind of research that you would imagine we do. Let me give you um, a somewhat different view uh, of, uh, uh, of a different kind of business school research, but something that we would still consider to be very, very much within um, our expertise, and that's um, research on institutional and social changes. So this is uh, this was the subject of a uh, of a presentation last year, um, and I just want to show a little bit about what Charlene has done. But this is a really interesting project, and I think probably uh, connects uh, with those of you in, in arts and architecture, especially. Um, so uh, in, in institutional and social change, what we're looking at is, you know, how institutions, how society changes in response to sustainability challenges, right? How we look at the world differently, how we can change the mindset of people um, and how social movements uh, can contribute to, to social change um, or to uh, sustainability change, I should say. Um, and so what uh, this project that Charlene worked on um, with uh, these other individuals I have on the slide here, um, is to think about how um, sustainable imaging um, can have an impact on changes in sustainable behavior and how uh, companies or how companies, how um, organizations, I should say, can engage in um, both a psychological as well as a, a graphic depiction of um, sustainable imagery such that people don't react negatively to it. So, the, you know, one of the ideas here is that being too direct, being too admonishing, being too graphic can actually turn people off. So in her research, they looked at how um, imagery that could at once be shocking could be presented in a way that people embrace it as a responsibility, uh, have a connection with the organization trying to make the message um, and actually understand uh, their contribution to uh, a, a sustainability challenge. And so let me just show you a little bit about uh, the, the, this video, um, which is available, uh, uh, it's, on, it's on YouTube, it's a, we'll put it on our webpage too, but I think it actually gives you some idea about how um, interesting um, and important this project is. I went to an exhibition. It was Chris Jordan and Manuel Maqueda presenting these fascinating pictures of baby albatross that have died after the injection of plastic. After the talk, um, we had the opportunity to talk with Manuel Maqueda and Chris Jordan. And they were telling us how they uh, were creating this organization in order to convince people that recycling was not the solution for plastic pollution, but 
people had to refuse plastic and change their consumption habits. These pictures have become the poster child of the anti-plastic pollution movement, influencing the way thousands of people think and feel about plastic pollution. These pictures work because people feel a visceral connection to the objects in the photo. Uh, the lighter, the bottled water top, and other things are objects of our everyday consumption. The pictures also show beautiful birds unwittingly feeding their chicks something which will kill them. The pictures of the dead albatross chicks are symbols of the hidden dangers of plastic pollution. They connect our daily activities with killing birds, causing us to feel guilt, and they also warn us that we are killing our own children by polluting their world with plastics. These pictures are, are very important for us I, um, they are the focus of our work. We are studying uh, uh, an NPO, a non-profit organization, an organization which was instrumental not only in the diffusion of those pictures, but also in the production, in the conceptualization, in the materialization of those pictures. Refusing plastic, it's an example of radical social change. We investigated this radical social change and we saw that um, it was very difficult to convince people just with numbers or with economic rational arguments. What was moving people were emotions. It is not enough to show a shocking picture such as the albatross picture we studied. Evoking moral shock can be counterproductive if people feel overwhelmed and disengaged. To manage social change effectively requires emotion symbolic work. Emotion symbolic work is a transformation of the negative emotion provoked by shocking images into the positive emotional energy necessary for the enactment of change. We hope. So um, that is a project that I'd like to highlight because I think it's you know somewhat different than your, your typical notion of business school research being a little bit more about investing and selling to consumers. And this is you know some of the more basic psychology um, that both businesses and NGOs have to engage in in order to influence uh, more sustainable behavior um, and uh, grab, I think, more of us on our sustainability path. Um, and so they uh, um, engaged in uh, a review of social media, um, which is a great way to assess how uh, a, uh, a nonprofit organization is having an impact on people um, and determined that there's this emotional symbolic combination that has to happen in order not to turn people off, but to actually bring people along. And so we use this kind of information um, in order to, uh, to, to have a, a stronger and more durable message. Um, so this is, uh, um, I think, a really important um, sort of psychological aspect of business research. Of course, we do supply chain um, research and sustainability as well. That's another one of our highlighted areas in Suresh, um, Mithalingam, and also Savrat uh, Danikar um, have uh, done this really interesting study where they um, looked at whether um, there are impacts of sustainability challenges on businesses if those can impact their sustainability outcomes. In other words, we know that businesses can change their behavior um, and have uh, different impacts in sustainability. But the question here is what about a sustainability challenge for a business? How does that um, alter its outcome? In other words, uh, uh, when there's scarcity, for example, um, in this case, water scarcity, um, how does that impact a firm's environmental performance? Uh, really interesting idea. And they looked at uh, water scarcity in Texas firms um, and determined that water scarcity does induce firms to reduce their toxic releases. Here's the really interesting thing about this research though. Um, you can imagine that firms that release toxic substances into water when they have more restrained water can't release as, much, uh, as many toxic substances. What they actually found is that firms were reducing their toxic releases into the air um, into the land, but not into the water. And so the, um, the, the understanding that uh, um, uh, Suresh and Sabrat came up with is this idea that um, essentially the firms are reorganizing their, their, um, their operations rather than just simply reducing output, that the sustainability shock um, actually changes their organizational behavior, uh, which is a really interesting thing. And this is entirely novel. This is a, an unpublished paper, but this is a, a new idea. 
Um, Karen Winderick is somebody that you probably have heard um, of because she is certainly one of our more prominent individuals uh, talking about influencing consumers. Um, and uh, certainly I think there are a lot of connections for those of you who produce sustainable materials and thinking about how to get consumers to engage with them. Um, and well, here's, here's, here's a little bit of a animated Karen. Admit it, there are times you've thrown recyclables in the trash. You're not alone. According to recent estimates, U.S. consumers recycle only 9% of plastics produced. Our research shows that marketing can make a difference. Consumers are significantly more likely to recycle when signage shows that recyclables can be transformed. Small changes to our marketing could mean large-scale benefits for our planet. So that's uh, that's a little piece that was actually produced by the, by the university to uh, uh, to summarize a little bit of Karen's research and um, one of the pieces I think that she has uh, that's incredibly interesting that is uh, a, a working paper right now but uh, will come out soon is a typology of failures uh, in sustainability initiatives. So what she did is they uh, they engaged a number of sustainability scholars. Um, and uh, try to identify specific reasons that sustainability initiatives fail rather than just determining how they failed. So why they fail, which is really interesting. And they came up with five different ways, um, including things like they backfire. Uh, for example, you tell people not to steal um, petrified uh, materials from the petrified forest and that incentivizes more people to steal it because it sounds really interesting. Um, uh, sustainability issues might have no net effect, doesn't make any change. They only have a partial success. Um, or uh, they induce people who feel good about engaging in sustainability one way to be very unsustainable in another way. So a negative effect and non-targeted behavior or they change over time. Um, so these are uh, different initiatives or different initiatives, different reasons that initiatives might fail. And her point and the point of uh, this particular research project is to say you need to figure out why uh, something doesn't work rather than just it doesn't work um, and that uh, the course needs to be changed. Um, finally, I wanted to talk about uh, Mark Desjardins, um, who engages in a little more uh, traditional uh, business school research, but uh, uh, looks at uh, um, the engagement of investors and, and actually uh, activism or um, uh, activist hedge funds specifically. Um, and this is a piece that actually, uh, or a series of research pieces that has gotten some, some press. Um, and uh, it's very interesting uh, because it actually suggests a negative impact of ESG. So we normally think of the ESG uh, metrics as being attractive to people who want to invest in sustainable businesses. Um, he showed, and they've showed in this, in this continuing series of projects, that activist hedge funds who think that companies that engage in socially responsible behavior um, and, or in sustainable behavior uh, might actually be misallocating their resources, might actually be uh, not focusing substantially on profit. So they go in um, and take over uh, some of the control of the company and try to maximize short-term profit and reduce other sustainable behaviors, such as uh, long-term vitality, uh, investments in sustainable initiatives. Uh, uh, they uh, um, uh, have less concern about regulatory violations. Um, and so that's, it's a really interesting uh, warning um, uh, about what can happen if, um, if you promote your sustainable behavior as a company. Um, and this is kind of a novel um, notion of a cost um, for ESG reporting. Um, and they note that it happens more often in um, areas where all firms are not sustainable. So where there is a distinction between some sustainable firms uh, and, and unsustainable forms um, and where there is less vagueness or sorry, where there's more vagueness uh, in the uh, financial reporting. So um, that's a, you know, kind of an overview of various research projects we have. I want to also note that the business school, we have the Terror Center for Responsible Ethics and Social Responsibility, which is a new uh, ethics-oriented center that we are collaborating with and is available more as a uh, teaching-focused uh, center, um, but uh, uh, we work with them certainly and we're all part of the same um, business school community, sort of what we might call the conscious of the business school. Um, and so to the extent that you're 
um, interested in engaging in ethics and social responsibility contacts with students, we might also share some of that action with the Terror Center. Um, and yes, yeah, so, so finally, you know, Kate, I think summarized what I do in, uh, um, uh, in legal and regulatory impacts, but I just wanna note that this is not the sole province of the law school that we also engage in uh, legal analysis and regulatory analysis from the business school perspective. So we have those um, possibilities there as well. So um, this was far too brief, I realize, um, for uh, you to get a deep sense of what these papers were, but um, and, and what the certainly the full scope of our research is. Um, but I wanted to at least just touch on a few things because we don't always get the opportunity to do this. So I, I mean, I really appreciate um, uh, if I really appreciate Kate, I really appreciate the college, I really appreciate you and giving me the opportunity to talk about this. To find out more, certainly you can visit our web pages, but also we have a continuing seminar series. Um, we already had Karen speak this year, uh, or this, uh, this month, I should say. Uh, we have Mark coming up, presenting some of the research I just mentioned. Evelyn Tomchik is gonna be talking about her research into biofuels. Um, and we are uh, typically going to present about three papers a semester or three research projects a semester. And we are interested in anybody who wants to come and view, especially uh, easy over Zoom these days, um, to come and see what uh, kinds of novel research are going on at the college and also to collaborate with us and, and communicate and criticize um, what we do. Um, so uh, not all of these are recorded. Um, um, in fact, uh, sometimes if, if it's a, an in-project piece of research, in-process in piece of research, excuse me, um, we actually may not record it. So it's really important that if you have the ability to, to, sh to be there in person, um, we'd, like to, uh, we'd like to have you there and, and like to hear your comments. Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, let's see, I'm sorry, I won't show that. Was, that was one that I don't have time to show, but... Um, I'll just end off with this because certainly I've, I've talked long enough. Um, we want to work with the broadest community that we can. Um, so certainly I encourage you to contact me um, if you want to learn more about research, contact one of the researchers or just if find other, some other way to facilitate a collaboration. Um, Eric Foley, like I said, is our center director and uh, he is generally responsible for all the things we do at CVOS, um, and he's always interested in your communications. And Megan Nolman uh, basically keeps everything working um, and organizes everything that we do. So she's also a, a great contact. So I present this just to say, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we'd love to work with you. Um, and we wanna be even more engaged with the uh, university community. Um, so I think that's, uh, I probably have used up more than, uh, uh, enough of my time, but uh, you know, Kate, if there if there's anyone who uh, has a question for me or some comments about anything that I talked about, um, and I'm certainly happy to put anyone in touch with the particular researchers I mentioned or any of the affiliates if you want to use me as a uh, facilitating contact.